How's it going? Um, it's really early in the morning for some Douglas. Uh, glad to see you guys here uh, in this webinar. Thank you everyone who's watching. And more importantly, thanks to Alex for joining us today. I know we're gonna have a really great talk, so look forward to that. Also, we have reserved the last 20 minutes for the session for your questions. So if you have any question, send them into the chat throughout the event. We'll try to get through them as many as we can in our QA session. Okay, cool. So before we get started, just a very quick intro of who Alex is and uh, what he's doing. Alex Liu is the founder and CEO of Micron Group, the leading digital asset trading group uh, with his service ranging from cryptocurrency exchange to blockchain related technology and its own subsidiaries, including Micoin, Amis, Max, and the largest exchange in Taiwan by trading volume. Alex's previous position in tech giants include those at Hitachi, Samsung, Siemens, and Qualcomm. Okay. Um, leaving management from Qualcomm, Alex is, uh, founded uh, Micron in 2014 and then developed Bloxier, um, a trading system that provides cryptocurrency for Senex and real-time risk scoring technology for compliance and law enforcement application in Taiwan. Also in 2020, one of its uh, subsidiaries, Amis, uh, cooperated with Taiwan's uh, Industrial Technology Research Institute to help carry out mobile blockchain payment project for Fubang Finance and received funding from National Development Fund. So between Alex's work in ICT and his work in blockchain technology, Alex has accumulated one of a kind experiences and insight about blockchain that we cannot wait to hear today. So without further ado, let's welcome Alex. Alex. Hi everyone. And, and thank you, Frank, for that very gracious introduction. I think you uh, did a better job than I can ever uh, introducing myself. So what I'll do with the hour that we have together is I will minimize the time that I spend talking about myself and our company and instead, you know, use this presentation, which runs over 30 pages to kind of frame the discussion. I like to leave as much as much time as possible uh, for the interactive portion, because I know that you folks being as young and as uh, knowledgeable as you are most likely know just about everything I'm about to introduce. What I'm more interested in hearing about is your viewpoints on what's going on in this industry and uh, using it as a lens to view more broadly what's going on in the world. Uh, but with that, I will launch into a few slides just to, again, frame the discussion. So a bit about myself. Um, on a personal level, I, uh, I was born here in Taiwan. Uh, I left at a very young age, at the age of two, and spent the subsequent 28 years in California growing up in the southern part of the state and then going to school and starting my career in the northern part of the state in Silicon Valley. I left when I was uh, when I turned 30 in the year 2008 uh, because I saw certain things going on in the years leading up to 2008 uh, that didn't exactly fit in with what I viewed to be a proper way to uh, conduct affairs in the world. Um, 2008, of course, that autumn, starting in September, was the uh, the financial crisis that cost the United States, uh, the world, um, hundreds of billions of dollars, millions of lost jobs, and years of lost opportunity. Prior to that, in 2002, leading up to 2003, uh, this was the beginning of a 20-year involvement by the United States, uh, military involvement in the Middle East. This was uh, in the wake of the September 11th attacks in uh, 2001. Of course, I'm sure you guys have been reading the news in the last few days. Uh, for better or worse, I would be inclined to say for worse, uh, America's military involvement in the Middle East over the last 20 years is coming to a very messy end. So those were actually the two events in summation that led me to say, hey, as wonderful and as comfortable as I was in California, I had to get out. I had to view the world through a different lens. That's what led me back to Asia. I spent a couple of years living and working in Korea, and then four years living in mainland China, in Shanghai, working for Qualcomm. Before, as Frank said, I decamped back to Taiwan, where I had left as an infant uh, to start a cryptocurrency company currently known as, as the MyCoin Group. Ah. 
I'll say one thing about my education. I was educated as an engineer on the West Coast of the United States at Stanford University. And that's how I tend to frame my uh, view of the world. Uh, that's how I tend to look at problems in the world. From, th from that perspective, then kind of extrapolate into what that means for human beings. So I just uh, spent the, the weekend actually finishing Elon Musk's um, biography that Ashley Vance wrote back in 2015. There was one takeaway that you know I, I very much agreed with. Elon, whether he's doing SpaceX or Tesla or anything that he's up to, he has a mantra, which is to take things down to physics. Okay, so whatever issue you're trying to solve or whatever you're trying to analyze, take it, take it, drill down into a ground state of truth. Uh, that's you know axiomatic. That is uh, unquestionable. Okay. If you're able to do that, I will, I will offer to you that you'll stand a much better chance of making sense of what's going on. That could be as difficult as a political situation or a personal relationship problem. It sounds weird, but you know, try try this approach. This is my own bias for for better or worse. Um, you know, it, it's worked for me for most of the part. So that again, that comes from my engineering education and background. Okay. Now, how in the world did I go from, you know, learning about electronics, semiconductors uh, to, to, to crypto and blockchain? Well, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about that um, as we delve into the, the, the crypto and blockchain topic uh, from here on out. Um, as Frank introduced, uh, we're actually the longest running and at this point, the lo largest either by user number, by uh, trading volume, and I would also argue the most compliant, <clears throat> meaning with government regulations to the extent that they exist here in Taiwan. So we've been in operation for over seven years. We have uh, well over half a million registered users here in Taiwan. Um, and, uh, you know, our trading volume, depending on the day, ranks somewhere between, you know, uh, 50 and 80 uh, in, in the world. Uh, but we're making our way toward the top. And there's no reason that I think we can't break into the top 20. I am not going to belabor uh, our milestones over the last seven to eight years, other than to point out that, yes, indeed, as Frank mentioned, we have trading operations which face uh, both consumers, like uh, retail trading, but also corporations, so more of an institutional uh, focus. We also have a, a company in the group called Ami. Uh, it's the French word for friends, but it's also the name of an Aboriginal tribe here in Taiwan uh, that focuses on the blockchain technology itself. And, and, and so we've, over the years, developed consensus algorithms that uh, JP Morgan has used in their uh, version of a, a private blockchain called Quorum. Uh, more recently, we've developed uh, threshold signature libraries that allow you to digitally sign transactions without ever assembling the private key, which is very helpful for security purposes, because the key, as uh, some of you may know, is, you know, the, the be all and end all in, in the blockchain industry. With the private key, you can do anything. In particular, you can steal uh, assets. And so by being able to do transactions without ever bringing the key together, that's actually a huge uh, bonus for for safety okay so if, for those of you who are familiar with coinbase um you'll, you'll find the following slides very uh very easy to understand so we started just like coinbase did as a brokerage so we source liquidity from all over the world and we presented a relatively simple user interface to customers here in taiwan that allowed them to use the native currency here which is the taiwan dollar to buy and sell bitcoin uh you know at at a price that we quote. So this is more of a brokerage. Um, now in 2008, so this started operation in 2014. And again, that was in recognition that there was not enough liquidity locally here in Taiwan to actually operate an exchange. But as the years went on, that, that, that changed. And, and so by 2018, we were ready to launch our exchange. So that's actually an order book that's presentable to, uh, to everybody. You, you have your bids and your asks and the exchange basically matches those orders. So with that, starting three years ago, we were able to do local price discovery and local liquidity aggregation. So this is, once again, the same sequence that Coinbase followed when they first had their you know, buy and sell service uh, that they started in 2012, 2013. And then some years later, they started the Coinbase exchange. So we followed in their footsteps.
I mean, as I spoke about earlier, um, it, it's more of a, it's not a trading company. It's a, a low level technology company, uh, but it, its primary audience is other businesses, whether it's financial institutions uh, or, or, or other uh, crypto uh, companies. Okay. Now, here's something that's very interesting and, and which Coinbase uh, does not have. So in the middle of downtown Taipei, we have a five-story building. Uh, it's in actually the electronics district of Taipei. And, um, you know, we opened this about two years ago. Um, this is actually a retail experience. So think of it as an Apple store for crypto. And, you know, you can walk in, have a cup of coffee, open an account. If you, you, if you have an account, you can troubleshoot it with us. Uh, we oftentimes, well, this was... Uh, especially in the pre-COVID days, uh, would have speeches and, uh, you know, uh, public events on the second floor. Uh, the third and fourth floor, uh, the third floor is actually a co-working space. So we will host uh, many other companies, uh, some of whom we work uh, with. Uh, and then the fourth floor and the fifth floor are our own offices. So uh, if you ever have the chance to come visit Taipei, please come by uh, the MyCoin HQ. So, you know, um, the last thing I'll say about this is cryptocurrencies and, and even blockchain as a technology is for many, many people, maybe even most people, very abstract, right? I mean, it's a piece of software, just like an app on your phone is, but it's it's also money. And, you know, that's an odd combination for most people to accept, especially that there isn't one company or, or let alone country behind this, right? And so the one of the main motivations for us doing this physical headquarters, this retail building is to give you know, the, the masses, the, the population, uh, a, a place where they can feel like, oh, you know, there's a there's an identifiable address, there's people that they can speak to uh, and, and interact uh, and ask questions of when it came to this topic. And so the end, end result is, you know, for the first five years of our existence, we were primarily serving, number one, a very young demographic, folks like yourselves uh, under the age of 30. But also a very male demographic. So not not coincidentally, um, it, it's the same demographic that plays video games. So that that's one of the reasons we chose to uh, to situate the the building in the, in the electronics district. But ever since we had this building, the people who will walk in and open accounts tend to be number one, older. So actually, the the, the median age is over forty, uh, and number two, a much more even ratio of men and women. And that's exactly the effect that we were uh, trying to achieve with this. And, and so it becomes much closer to walking into a bank branch or into a, you know, a, a, a stock uh, brokerage. And, uh, you know, this is not unlike uh, what Amazon has done. I mean, it started selling, you know, books 20 years ago, and then everything online. Guess what? They're now opening department stores. I mean, it's crazy to think about, but that's exactly what's, uh, what, what has happened. By the way, uh, if you guys have any comments or questions, you know, feel free to just, you know, interject. Okay, so I, I don't want to make this too formal. Um, Frank has a chat window open. You guys can just uh, throw your questions in there, and I'll do my best to to respond. All right, I probably don't need to tell you guys too much about the cryptocurrency market. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of Bitcoin. I don't know how many of you have actually owned or interacted with it, but. Um, it's actually in the last 10 years grown to be quite a significant market. Actually, it recovered the $2 trillion level in recent weeks. So even, um, you know, in the money markets and in the commodity markets, it's no longer a small thing. Okay. Um, I won't belabor the Bitcoin future features. Um, it's a form of money, a volatile form of money that is uh, publicly maintained and, you know, publicly uh in, in, inspectable. And um, I'll talk more about what this means for, for Taiwan, situated as we are between mainland China and the United States, uh, because you'll see on this topic of Bitcoin that different countries, depending on their political systems, are taking pretty divergent approaches. Um, and, you know, a uh, gentleman here, Subam, just uh, put that question exactly to me. It says, well, he's asking about uh, China. We'll come around to that, okay? So uh, you hold me to that. And then uh, what does that mean for us here in Taiwan? We're very close to China. We're only about you know 100 kilometers away. Uh, but as far as crypto regulations are concerned, 
there's actually quite a bit of difference between what's going on here in Taiwan and what's going on on the mainland. All right. One area that I really do want to focus in on is stable coins. So I said Bitcoin is a very volatile uh, and stable coins, as this name suggests, is the opposite of that. At least it's supposed to be. OK, the basic idea is I put a, a, an amount of money in the bank. I make that inspectable. And then on a blockchain, I will issue the same amount of coin. And so if you believe that it's fully convertible, you can take one dollar and get one coin. You can take one coin and get back your dollar. Then it should be very straightforward to believe that that coin, that that cryptocurrency coin is worth one dollar. Right. And so over the last five years or so, this has turned into a almost one hundred billion dollar market. The biggest one is something called Tether, but there's many, many others now. The reason I want to focus in on this is because I actually think it's stable coins which are going to change global payments, okay, and not Bitcoin, although they're very related because they're both forms of cryptocurrencies. But needless to say, in daily life, we want our money to be stable and, and not wildly fluctuating like Bitcoin is. And this is where most of the government regulation is now focused on stable coins and, and not necessarily on Bitcoin, all right? We'll come around to this. And in going back to Subam's question, um, you'll see that uh, in particular, the United States government has taken an approach that I think is uh, very welcoming uh, of stable coins in the payment system. And that's the approach that I hope uh, the government here in Taiwan will take as well. Okay. All right, so this is a growing market, $100 billion worth. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll come now to a, uh, a differential view of what's going on on the mainland, especially in recent weeks and months, um, and then what in particular is going on in the United States, and then what does that mean for us here in Taiwan? So a lot has happened over the last one year. Um, first off, a little bit over a year ago, in late July of 2020, um, the primary bank regulator in the United States, it's uh, called the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC for short. It's under the Treasury Department. They actually opened the gates for banks. These are licensed financial institutions in the United States to be able to custody Bitcoin and to be able to transact Bitcoin, okay? And with that, not coincidentally, within days or weeks, PayPal opened up their Bitcoin and cryptocurrency uh, purchase function, okay? Because PayPal, with hundreds of millions of users is a regulated financial institution. So without the OCC saying, yes, this is okay, PayPal would not have uh, dared to, to, to do such a thing. All right. Now, I will argue to you that even in the long term, more significant than this Bitcoin uh, ruling from the OCC was their ruling early this year on January 6th, I believe, around stable coins. Because what they said, in early this year was that banks, again, regulated financial institutions can now use stable coins for payment purposes. So they can settle financial transactions using stable coins. And sure enough, within a few months, you saw Visa, which is a regulated financial institution, accept USDC, which was one of those stable coins for, for, for settlement purposes. And you know, a simple thought experiment is, how often do you do investment, right? Buy and sell stocks, buy and sell gold, real estate, you know, versus how often do you use payment systems, you know, buy a can of Coke or, you know, buy something on Amazon. I would say for me, at least the ratio is something like 50 to one, right? I do payments quite a bit more than I manage my portfolio. So that's why I think that this early January ruling by the OCC is actually much more significant because stable coins are used for payments. Bitcoin is used for investment. Now that banks can actually use stable coins, that's the game, game, that's the game changer. Now, this is, again, on the, on the US side. Let me contrast this, what's going on on the mainland. So uh, you may have read in the news that in recent years, but in particular in the last two years, uh, the central bank uh, of China, the People's Bank, uh, has been pushing their uh, sovereign digital currency, the, the digital RMB. Uh, a technical name for it is DCEP. Now, unlike Bitcoin, this is a uh, 
so-called permissioned or a consortium blockchain. So in Bitcoin, anybody with a computer can theoretically participate, but that's not true of DCEP. You need to be uh, essentially permission. You need to be given permission. So you need to be a financial institution or you need to be a partner nation. Uh, you know, for, for China, I think very likely candidates for uh, pushing DCP abroad would be, you know, countries such as Russia, for sure, but also Iran, uh, Pakistan, uh, and maybe some African countries that China does a lot of trade with. Now, I want to put a question out to, uh, to everyone and, you know, just give me your thoughts. Why is China pushing this so hard? Because you, you don't see so far the United States pushing their own blockchain. Instead, the American approach has been, okay, there's existing blockchains out there and I'm gonna let my financial institutions participate. But why is China taking a different approach and, and pushing essentially their own blockchain that is permissioned? Ah, Subam has a, a good guess. China believes in control. That's exactly right. Um, what else? Okay, well, I mean, that's it actually. <laughs> now, national security, yep, absolutely. Um, yes, it, this type of blockchain is uh, easier to surveil. So Jonathan uh, suggested that correctly. Now, let me ask a follow-on question. In the long-term, meaning five, 10 years out, which, which approach, whether the American approach of using stable coins on public blockchains or the, uh, the Chinese approach of using uh, permission blockchains, which one do you think is going to be um, more widely uh, adopted around the world? Let, let's just say in terms of user numbers. Uh, so anybody, do you think it's the Chinese approach or the American approach? Okay, yeah, whichever is easy for consumers to enter into. All right. Well, I mean, that's the question, isn't it? Wh which is easier for the consumer? What, what's better for the consumer? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing several votes for the American approach. I, I would tend to agree. I would tend to agree um, that because the American approach is, let's use public blockchains like Ethereum or, you know, there's, there's a few dozen now, right? Um, I, I agree that that's gonna be, for the most part, more attractive to, to most people around the world. The, the DCEP will probably offer, you know, faster transaction times, you know, lower transaction fees. That's probably true as well. But because it's, it's permissioned, right? Only, you know, uh, the, the banks in China or like, the, uh, you know, Alipay uh, and only really countries that are friendly with China are going to be part of this network. So yes, I, I agree with most people here um, that, Again, if you look things, if you look at things five or ten years out, that you know it, 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 the the open approach, I think, will be more broadly adopted around the world. Each system has their advantages and disadvantages, and uh, China is doing what's best for China. Um, but back to Taiwan, um, you know, I, I think that everything else being equal, I think that Taiwan as a society and Taiwan as a government will most likely take the approach uh, that the United States is, which is to regulate for sure, not, not, not to let this become some type of free for all, but on the whole, allow these public blockchains to reach the consumer. Okay. That's why uh, my coin as a company can even exist. So DCP uh, is very much in line with um, especially recent Chinese government policy around internet companies. You, you may have read that, you know, they're doing all sorts of things to, to crack down uh, or, or to open up the, the data trove that these internet companies in China um, have collected over the years. Now, I'll say that the same thing is more or less happening in the United States. So the, the Federal Trade Commission has a new head, her name's Lena Khan, and she's you know, known to be quite a hawk against the big internet companies in the US. But at the end of the day, the American approach toward uh, internet company regulation is probably going to lean more toward antitrust. So they're going to try to break up, you know, what they consider to be monopolies or oligopolies. Whereas the Chinese approach, as we've seen in recent weeks and months, has been directly to <laughs> take much uh, uh, more, 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 more serious action, you know, uh, hands on. Okay. All right. So keep that in mind that, you know, the, 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 
the path that cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology will take is very much rooted in local government and political systems. So when I discovered Bitcoin in 2013, I was actually still living in Shanghai. And my classmate from Stanford is a fellow named Bobby Lee. He, he actually sold me my first Bitcoin in early 2013 for 400 uh, RMB, which is maybe $60 US. Um, and he tried to convince me to stay in Shanghai with him to start a, a cryptocurrency exchange. I, um, I thought about it for quite a number of days, but in May of 2013, and these were my exact words to him, I said, Bobby, uh, what you're proposing is uh, it's not a technology proposition. You know, it's not because Bitcoin is a new technology that you're going to succeed. It's not even a business proposition. What you're proposing running a crypto exchange uh, in mainland China is actually a political proposition because that's how things are viewed in China. And unless you're as, you know, as connected as possible in China, which neither Bobby nor I were or are, um, you know, it, it's not going to be a very pretty ending. And, and so I, I think over the years, that was over eight years ago that I said that to him, but I, I think that has more or less borne out to be true. Now, to be fair, Taiwan at that time was also not a friendly place for this stuff, but I was just using my own sort of sociological observations about Taiwan. And I, I said, look, over time, it will become a reasonably hospitable place for this line of business because of, well, just the way the society is and the way that the government responds to societal um, needs and, 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 and wants. And, and I think that's, that's true. And, and then, again, I want to emphasize that really, I think the floodgates have been opened to this industry uh, in the United States over the last year. And um, as long as Taiwan follows that path, for cryptocurrencies, not for necessarily everything in society, then uh, we're going to be a good place. We're going to be in a good place, at least uh, as far as the Chinese speaking world is concerned. Okay. So this gives you guys um, one example. Okay. So I, I mentioned that I, I, I was trained as an engineer. I kind of view things toward that technical lens, but I also, you know, use that to kind of look at societal, you know, uh, characteristics and, and differences. And I said, look, given what I knew even back eight years ago about Bitcoin, I was like, well, okay, I, I should go back to the question, why did I think that China would not be very friendly to this? Well, think about how Bitcoin works. And you know, I spent about four days and nights reading the source code of Bitcoin when I first discovered it. And when I realized how it worked, I'm like, oh boy, you know, that means I can send money to you and you can send money to, to you know, anyone around the world with nobody in between, which means, you know, this becomes very difficult to control. And as Subam mentioned on the chat, China believes in control. So if you're going to fight against that, you're not going to meet a very good end, <laughs> at least in China. Okay. Um, all right. So enough about that. You, you guys probably get the point. Um, all right. You know, the next few slides, uh, it's, about corporate involvement. You guys have read that, you know, Elon Musk via Tesla has been buying Bitcoin and so have many listed companies in the United States. Um, there are two dozen ETF applications in the pipeline at the SEC. It's gonna happen, all right? That has not really begun here in Taiwan, but it's gonna happen. So whatever we've seen in the United States around financial institutions and listed companies, either buying the crypto directly uh, or listing. That was a big thing this, um, uh, this April when Coinbase went public on NASDAQ. That was a big deal. That's a big deal, all right? I mean, that, that was a huge signal for, uh, for us here in Taiwan. Um, and and this, this slide simply lists, you know, some of the known holdings of uh, public companies. MicroStrategy with over 100,000 Bitcoin uh, being the most famous one, but Tesla is not too far behind. So um, again, I think this is the beginning of a very long-term trend, which um, is very welcome from my perspective, but very meaningful from a broader perspective. And with this, um, I, I'd like to kind of ask you guys, what, is, what in the world is going on? I mean, you know, why did Bitcoin go from 
you know, almost 3000, it went down almost to $3,000 in, in March of last year. And by the end of last year, it was, you know, at, at, at 20,000. And then by, you know, the first half of this year, it was, it touched 60, came back down again, and now it's uh, back at 50. What in the world is going on? Is it, you know, just, okay, Elon was a factor, that's true. I mean, but why did Elon get into it? More liquid, okay, all right, now, now we're talking. So Subham, what do you mean by liquidity? Well, that's true. I wouldn't invest. I wouldn't invest in a bank. But you you hit it on the nail there, which is liquidity. So there's a lot more liquidity sloshing around. Why? Inflation. Okay. So there you go. So what happened? What was the big news of the last year and a half? Right. It's been this pandemic, right, and it's impacted economies around the world primarily in a negative fashion. And so in response, with the U.S. government in the lead. What has central? What have central banks been doing? I mean, they've been printing money, right? Because they want to encourage banks to lend to businesses. They want to encourage uh, individuals to to spend money to consume. Do you know how much money uh, the United States Federal Reserve is printing every month right now? Do you guys have a rough figure? Is it uh, one billion, ten billion, one hundred billion? or 1 trillion. So uh, Shubham is guessing 10 bill, uh, more than that. More than that. It's less than 1 trill, but way more than 10 bill. OK, the number right now is, as we speak, is $120 billion per month. So yep, Roger got it. So $120 billion a month. Of course, there's talk of this taper, which is instead of 120 billion per month, maybe it goes down to, I don't know, 80 billion per month, but that's still an enormous number. So when the pandemic began, uh, the, 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 the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve was right around $4 trillion. And in the last 18 months, um, it's more than doubled. It's, it's gone up to $8 trillion. So this is an enormous amount of money that's being injected into the financial markets. So it's no wonder that stock markets, crypto markets, everything uh, are at all time highs. Needless to say, this does not directly correlate with people's well-being. Okay, but uh, if you're a financial guy and you're just watching the numbers on your screen, it looks great. Okay. <laughs> um, and for better or worse, crypto is a financial phenomenon. And that's why we're talking about it today, honestly. Um, Frank asked whether, you know, I think there'll be a crisis if the money spigot slows down or stops. I mean, it depends on what you mean by crisis. I mean, will there be a halt in the, you know, bubble? Sure. Uh, but is that a crisis? If what if what would you mean by crisis is a bad thing, I'm I'm not so sure because we all live in the real world, and unfortunately, I don't think the financial markets always reflect reality. So, um, you know, um, there you have it. You know, your guess is as good as mine. All right. So I mentioned Coinbase listing in April. Um, Stock market's not the economy. Reverse repo, exactly, right? So um, Jonathan's got it right. And I will return to this point, guys, because you know I'm roughly 20 years older than you folks. And when I look at the world now versus you know what I understood to be the world when I was your age, boy, I, I've got some thoughts to share with you. I'll, I'll come back to this once I finish running through the slides. ETF makes it easier to trade. It becomes basically, uh, like trading stocks, um, that will get approved, I think, in the next one to two years, starting in the United States. All right. The, 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 there are two topics that I just like to lightly touch upon um, to conclude the slide part of the presentation, the first of which is called decentralized finance, uh, DeFi for short. So what it is, is um, based on 
public blockchains, uh, the most popular of which is, is Ethereum. So Ethereum made its name in, in blockchain uh, about five or six years ago because they allow you to write contracts, computer code, essentially, general purpose computer code that runs on blockchains and allows you to essentially dictate uh, financial contract terms on a blockchain. So you essentially the easiest way to understand this is you can now publish your own coin. You can make your own coin within five minutes by saying in your contract, just a few lines of computer code, you say how much of the coin I want to issue, what's my inflation or deflation policy, what's my distribution policy, et cetera. And with that, if you just take it a step further, you can, with a bit more complicated logic, you can now allow people to exchange directly on the contract to say, here, what, what, we, what we do, MyCoin does in a centralized fashion, meaning we have a company, we have a platform, we have a database. Now you can do this on the uh, blockchain itself. And so there's been an explosion in the last two years of this type of activity, uh, of lending, of, of, of trading uh, directly without intermediaries on blockchains, okay? DApps, exactly. Um, what's the significance of this? Well, this means that truly permissionless finance has come about. You can dictate, you know, arbitrary terms in these contracts. You can have 1,000 times leverage. You can have, you know, a million times, a million percent interest rate, whatever you want, you can now execute uh, on blockchains, which is to say you can now conduct financial transactions in that fashion. Whether you're going to have a counterparty or not is up to you to find, all right? But theoretically, anything becomes possible um, with, with DeFi. And so unlike with Coinbase or unlike with MyCoin, you have to essentially follow some... Um, some regulations or uh, some, some platform policies that we set with DeFi, you don't have to, okay? Now, there are some downsides to DeFi in that, you know, the transactions are slow and expensive, but this is uh, in many ways, um, you know, very significant uh, for finance. So it's cooled down in recent months, but it's a long-term trend. And this is something that I encourage you folks to, uh, to keep an eye on, or if, if, if not actually participate in. Okay, the last thing, well, all right. You know, I'll, I'll summarize the rest of the, the, the presentation here because I think uh, Frank wants to open things up directly for Q&A, which I'm very much in agreement with. There is a melding of traditional securities. So security means uh, a debt instrument or an equity instrument. So this is what you trade on the stock exchanges or on the bond markets. You can now, well, in certain jurisdictions, um, Europe, Singapore being in the lead, you can now trade those securities in the form of tokens as coins, basically. And in one sentence, the primary advantage of that is that they can now trade across borders 24-7, 365 days a year, unlike stock exchanges, which trade six or seven hours per day, five days a week, et cetera. So that's something to very much look forward to. Um, and then the last topic is something called non-fungible tokens, NFTs for short. For short, I'm sure you've heard the acronym in recent uh, months. What the idea here is simply that unlike fungible tokens like Bitcoin, where one Bitcoin is theoretically indistinguishable from any other Bitcoin, NFTs are meant to be unique. They're meant to be essentially collector items, all right? So... Um, this, I think, is going to popularize cryptocurrencies. When you buy a Michael Jordan um, NFT, you know, uh, you're only going to care that it's Michael Jordan's, you know, beautiful play in the 1991 finals, right? And you own that moment. You're the owner because there's only one of those NFTs in creation, all right? But you're going to trade it. You're going to move it around conveniently between platforms. And that's the only thing you're going to care about. The fact that it's a cryptocurrency, that it's a unique uh, coin, you don't care, all right? And so I can tell, talk to you until I'm blue in the face about why Bitcoin is meaningful, why blockchain is meaningful, what it means for politics and global affairs. But frankly, most people don't care about that stuff. They only care about Michael Jordan or a piece of art or you know something that you know is much closer to daily life. So this is the significance of NFTs. Uh, you're seeing it now in, in, in the arts, in sports, 
in, in gaming and entertainment. So I don't know if any of you guys play Minecraft or, or Roblox, right? But these are virtual worlds that you can have land and items and, you know, you have ownership of, right? But you'll notice that up until now, you can only have your possessions within that game or within that platform. Well, guess what? With Axie Infinity, with the Sandbox, et cetera, these are Minecraft and Roblox based on NFTs. So everything in that virtual world is now an NFT and it exists on a public blockchain like Ethereum. And so you can now move these possessions between worlds. And so very soon, that's, the, that's what you're going to appreciate. That's the consumer convenience that each, each of us wants. And you're not going to care that it's based on blockchain. All right. So... That's going to be my, uh, the formal part of my, my talk. Uh, let's open it up. I know you guys have a lot of questions and your own thoughts. So um, just, just uh, speak up and then we'll have an open discussion. Okay, uh, I think, uh, Delegates, can you, um, you can raise your hand if you have any question you want to ask to Alex directly. I can uh, unmute you. I saw a lot of questions here. Anyone want to ask directly? Yeah. Let me take. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I've got this from uh, from my uh, helper, Ellen, who want to ask some question about uh, DLT. So, how can we leverage the trust of a public DLT while maintaining the advantages of private DLT networks? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I, I mentioned that you know, like a private DLT is one example is what the People's Bank of China is doing with DCEP, right? So, the advantage of that is because the number of nodes are much smaller; they're usually just a few dozen. Um, the The speed of transactions can be much quicker, and you can handle many more transactions per unit time. Uh, but the disadvantage is, well, you know, fewer people get to participate. Okay. Um, I'll take this question along with what Shubham just asked around, you know, the environmental impact of, of, of mining, of essentially verifying transactions. So as we speak, um, the Ethereum blockchain is undergoing an upgrade. It's called a hard fork uh, called London, which will swap out its uh, mining process for something called proof of stake, where based on how many Ethereum coins, Ether coins you own and you stake, meaning you have an economic incentive to validate correctly, you can now actually get rid of this very energy intensive process called mining. And so that's a huge step toward making uh, blockchains uh, more environmentally friendly. All right. Now, how does this relate to transaction speeds? Theoretically, with proof of stake, uh, because you don't have to spend time and so much energy mining, you can have much improved uh, speeds and throughputs. So uh, these are still very much works in progress, but this is definitely the direction that things are moving toward. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex, for answer question from Ellen. And then we had a question from Jonathan. So it results in monopoly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it is a matter of you know, going to great lengths to decentralize things, right? So um, you can place, 51% attack is actually on mining. It's on proof of stake, uh, proof of work, I'm sorry. It's not, not as applicable to uh, proof of stake. So just a clarification there. Yeah, I was just wondering, Alex, as well, with regards to um, cybersecurity, and how, how do you see that coin exchanges have handled the issue of cybersecurity standards? and? dealing with uh, a variety of issues such as um, recalling the, the 2016 DAO attack and the, the ability for companies to address the issue of cybersecurity by design within the apps. Yeah, it, it's a huge issue, as you know, Jonathan. Just in recent weeks, um, you know, there was a, a DeFi project that got hacked to the tune of $600 million, which is quite a princely sum uh, because of uh, incorrectly or uh, faulty smart contract. So it's a huge issue. Um, and it's going to be one of the bottlenecks for um, growth in this industry. But having said that, I mean, for every faulty contract, for every hacked platform, there are, you know, many, I, I can't give you exactly what the ratio is, but there are many, many transactions that are successful and safely uh, done um, for, for every one of these hacks. And, and um, you know, no new technology is going to go through uh, 
you know, a painless process, but I do believe things are getting better, especially once again, if you amortize this over the, the economic value of the transactions being transacted. So you pointed out the Dow incident at the very beginning of uh, Ethereum back in 2016, right? Uh, that was, uh, well, I mean, it was it was a huge sum for what Ethereum was at that time. Um, but look at the explosion of applications and, and transactions on Ethereum over the last five years, right? So the stakes get larger. So if there's a hack, the dollar amount goes up, but then the amount of economic activity that's being transacted also goes up. And as long as that's the case, ideally the economic transactivity activity goes up at a faster rate than the, the number of hacks, um, then I, I still think this is a, heading in the right direction. Okay, uh, thank you, Alex. We also have a question from Shubham, so that's... Yeah, Alex, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so Alex, uh, I also invest in cryptocurrency. Any specific altcoins or any cryptocurrency would like to uh, recommend to investors? Yeah, I, uh, we'll start with the... Uh, well, so this is not investment advice. This is just me sharing random thoughts. Um, you can start with the oldies. I mean, I, I think you're not going to go wrong with holding some Bitcoin and Ethereum or Ether, uh, especially now that, you know, ETH is going this undergoing this upgrade to ETH 2.0. Uh, I'm, I'm long term bullish on it because um, it's becoming less environmentally damaging. It's, it's going to improve its throughput. Uh, it speeds, et cetera. And, and that's only going to enable more applications and therefore transactions. So I, I'm, I'm bullish on these two oldies, but goodies. Um, as far as, you know, newer projects, I, I go back to my point about DeFi, you know, um, there's a Ethereum staking protocol called Lido, L-I-D-O, you can take a look at. Uh, their token has been doing well. Um, but any of those, you know, more mature DeFi projects, I think, are, are, are worth looking at. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Okay, uh, Alex, uh, a question from me, because you mentioned DeFi. Uh, what do you think of the future of DeFi in terms of uh, its competition and an integration with traditional finance? Yeah, fantastic question. So, okay, let me use a... Um, uh, sort of counter example, how about this? And then I'll come back to your point, which is over the last three or four years, there have been a number of very large, very successful centralized platforms, right? Either exchanges for spot markets or derivative markets. But the reason they've gone to be so big and successful is because they offered a lot of the advantage of freedom. Maybe you only need an email address to sign up. Uh, maybe you can do 100 times leverage. These are all things that are not possible in regulated centralized platforms such as Coinbase or such as MyCoin. So if you want freedom, you go to one of these platforms. And if you've been trading crypto, you probably know, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. So with the maturation of DeFi, here's my thesis, which is if you want to... Um, go from 100 times leverage to 1,000 times leverage for whatever reason, go to DeFi, right? If you want to list uh, any token and not go through some sort of permissioning process, go to DeFi, right? So that's absolute freedom because you're interacting with just a smart contract. You're not even interacting with a human being, right? So that's one extreme, if you will. The other extreme is if you want fiat currency, if, because at the end of the day, most people still transact in fiat currency. That's how you get your salary. That's you know what your bank account is denominated in. Uh, you're going to be dealing more and more likely with a regulated platform, right? So my point here is what you've seen in the last three to four years with these kind of free-for-all centralized platforms, I think that middle ground is actually going to disappear. I actually think you'll see a sort of a dumbbell shape take place to say, okay, if you want to have a regulated, even perhaps even insured platform, you want to have the, the safety and, and the security of a bank, let's say, right? You're going to be dealing with one of the regulated platforms. But if you want absolute security, if you want to trade any crazy token at a thousand times leverage, you're going to go to DeFi, right? So that's, that's what I see in the next few years happening. Okay, on that note, uh, how do you consider uh, US steps on 
uh, taking more control or uh, adding more regulation to DeFi? Well, I know in recent days, Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC, has said a few words about that, but I, I haven't seen any uh, concrete action yet, right? Mm -hmm. Even at the end of the day, I mean, DeFi is still going to be more free than CeFi, centralized finance. I mean, there's just no, no question about that, right? So I, I stand by my prediction, which is you'll see this sort of, you know, um, dumbbell shape take place. Okay, thank you, Alex. So um, anyone have any questions? Please put it in the chat or raise your yep. hand. Okay, Jonathan. we have um, Jonathan. Yep. Jonathan. Yep. Yeah, so I guess just sort of related to the last question, what uh, independent steps do you think that coin exchanges can take in order to promote a fair, stable and equitable market for retail investors? particularly when you're dealing with a uh, pump and dump situation, yeah. Wales or, or any other sort of uh, market threats. Sure. Um, so number one, don't list like random shit coins, right? I mean, people are, are uh, bound to get hurt when, when you list any coin under the sun, right? If you want to play those crazy games, like I said, go to DeFi. But C5, because, you know, I mean, we have a store in the middle of Taipei for Christ's sake, you know, like we have all sorts of people coming in. We have to be a bit more responsible with the coins that we trade um, market manipulation, as you say, right. Pump and dumps um, whales manipulating it. You know, I, I think um, you're going to see more and more the types of market surveillance and, and consumer protection mechanisms. Hopefully, you know, I, this is just my personal bias. I, we don't see like circuit breakers, like stock markets, you know, when they go up and down 5%, then they get shut down for the day, right? Um, I, I think there's a there's a, a sweet spot. We don't want to go too far into the traditional world because then I think you begin to surrender a lot of the advantages uh, that the crypto markets bring. But nonetheless, some degree of uh, investor protection, you know, if your exchange gets hacked, if uh, you know there are flash crashes, et cetera, et cetera. So th th that's the uh, the price you pay um, for for safety. Okay, we only have five minutes left. I want to return. I want to return to a point that I, I made earlier, which was um, you know how I think th the world has changed in the last twenty years. I think um, in, in many ways. Uh, you know, I, I envy you folks because you guys are young, you guys have your lives in front of you and careers, you can mold the world the way you want. But in, on the other hand, I actually worry for you folks too, because a lot of the certainties that I took for granted, right, that number one, there would be peace in our time. Number two, that the climate is some problem that's, you know, 100, 50, 100 years out in the future. Those are not assumptions that you guys can safely make. Um, and, you know, I, I spent a lot of my waking hours thinking about these things. And, and, and so what I'm trying to tell you guys here is, yes, it's great to go off and work with finance. It's great to like issue your own cryptocurrency, you know, trade NFTs. That's all good and great. All right. But don't lose sight of the reality of the physical world, the society, you know, we have to we have to always ground ourselves in that. And there are some really difficult problems right now that are facing humanity, right? Um, there are shifts in the balance of power between countries that are leading to all sorts of tensions and God forbid conflicts. Um, the environment is changing visibly in front of our eyes. Um, I, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in California, um, you know, we get less and less rain, less and less snow. Uh, it, you know, droughts are, are just multi-year affairs these days. So I know you guys are aware of this because even in the chat box, I got questions around the environmental sustainability of, of crypto mining. I got questions from, I think, Frank about what this means for uh, carbon trading, you know, what it means for pricing carbon. These are all things that I've tried to... Uh, 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 dabble with, I suppose. I'll, 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 I'll offer this to you guys, which is look at the way Bitcoin is traded. It's traded across thousands of platforms around the world. Um, it's issued by no one in particular. It's issued by 30,000 lines of computer code, but it's fungible, 
you know it's the opposite of an nft right it, it's 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 completely liquid on a global basis doesn't that remind you of the way that carbon dioxide you know travels between borders and therefore should be priced between borders right so those are like again two ends of the spectrum whereas number one for the most part carbon dioxide is not even priced in most parts of the world all right so there are carbon exchanges in europe in in california on the east coast of the u.s uh, the mainland, mainland China is experimenting with it, but it's it's nowhere near mature. And if you accept the um, the point that pricing carbon is very important to quantifying this problem and and in the long term mitigating it, well, is there something there between the way cryptocurrencies work and are very liquid and what carbon should be as, as a global financial market? Um. So I, I haven't cracked this puzzle yet, you know, uh, because uh, cryptocurrencies are just computer code, as you know, but carbon is a highly regulated thing, um, if, if regulated at all. So there are still huge separation between these two worlds. But if I don't get around to it in my career and lifetime, I hope that you guys being, you know, 20 years younger than me do and that you can actually create globally liquid carbon markets. I don't think that we'll ever get to one single price for carbon as we do have more or less for Bitcoin, you know, plus or minus 1%, but at least a liquid cross-border market for carbon as we do for currencies, right? There's the Singapore dollar, the Hong Kong dollar, the US dollar, the yen, and you can trade between these two. There won't be one currency to rule the world, but at least there's liquid markets between the currencies. And if we can accomplish that with carbon, I think we're well on our way to pricing and therefore quantifying and solving the problem. So, um, so don't get lost in the financial you know, fantasy. They're just numbers dancing around on a computer screen. I think it's important to marshal financial resources to address real world problems. But I mentioned at the beginning of the hour that I had just finished uh, Elon Musk's um, biography. I, I, I drew, drew great inspiration from that because, uh, so Shubham, I recommend Elon Musk's biography by Ashley Vance. This guy, you know, he, he started two internet companies, one called Zip2, which you've never heard of, but that, was the springboard for him starting PayPal. PayPal is financial services, very much as what we're talking about today. But what did he do with his riches from selling PayPal? He went and built rockets. He went and built electric vehicles. He you know, did a solar company. I mean, he took those financial resources and he tried to do something in the real world uh, that, that presumably improves the real world. So that's what I'm going to leave you with. You guys are young. You got everything ahead of you. But um, don't, um, don't ignore one at the expense of the other, right? So if you're going to go headlong into finance and making money, go do it. Once you've made your riches, come back to the real world and hopefully make it better. On the other hand, if you're going to attack real world problems head on, it could be poverty, hunger, uh, you know, pandemics, disease, don't forget that you'll need financial resources to make a dent in these problems, okay? So that's that's the point that I want to leave you with. Um, there's, there's, a, there's the head, uh, you, you, you gotta have a head for this, but you also need to have your, uh, uh, your, your feet firmly planted on the ground. And so um, with that, you know, it's been a real pleasure interacting with you folks and um, see you around, I guess. Okay, uh, sounds perfect, Alex. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoy your talk and I believe the audience as well. Okay, so delegates, thank you for joining our webinar today and feel free to leave as we are ending the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Okay, take care, guys. Bye-bye.